All right. We're a little smaller today uh, because of the crisis. Uh, it has been, we were trying to think, probably March, April, May, June, four months since we met. I was mentioning earlier, it was actually colder outside when we met last, and now it's burning up outside. Uh, so a lot of changes, and, and we have a gap to, to kind of get over, kind of a speed bump. But I believe where we left off was Matthew 12, and we had just talked about, well, not just, we had spent some time talking about the Sabbath day, and I believe we spent a good week, let me start this, just in case that other one doesn't work. So we had talked uh, for a couple of weeks about the Sabbath day, and we spent at least a week, maybe two, on what the Sabbath day means to the Jews, how they... Um, how they interpreted Sabbath day practically in their life, the religious obligations that were part of the Sabbath day. And then we talked through why it had such impact when they encountered Jesus and his disciples perceivably ignoring those religious rituals. Um, and we talked about what the Sabbath really meant to God and how the Sabbath was set up for, you know, for his people to begin with. And then we talked about how the Jewish law had changed and the Jewish traditions and how they had adapted things to certain times and certain experiences. Remember, we talked about their huge devotion to religious devotion. Devotion to devotion, you like that? Their, their devotion to the practices came out of their Babylonian experience and how they really didn't want to repeat that experience. And so they put into practice the obligations of the law, but they did it more for obligation instead of relationship with God. And that's where it started to break down. And then we had years and years of the obligations, the obligatory uh, practices of the, of the religion without the heart of the religion. And so Jesus was encountered a couple times by the Pharisees and the leaders about the, uh, his practices on the Sabbath. We talked through that. And we got to the point where um, he healed on the Sabbath, and they didn't like that. And the last, I believe, the last verse we talked through was verse 14 in chapter 12, Matthew 12, which says, The Pharisees went out and plotted how they might kill Jesus. And in my notes, where I have to start is just the question, why would they want to kill Jesus? Um, and we've, we've actually mentioned this before, but... If you can kind of dig out of your memory, because it has been a while, what do you think? Why, did, why would the Jews want to kill Jesus? The, the leaders want to kill Jesus? Several reasons. Power and pride. Jesus hit them where it mattered most in their lives. Prestige. They didn't like what he had to say because he kept chopping them down on the totem pole. Um, he kept hitting them where it hurts. And they didn't like that. So there is a all about me part of why they would want to kill him. Just it, it, it develops this personal anger toward him. What else? Well, you didn't use the word pride exactly, but you touched They enjoyed stature. Yes. They enjoyed the condescending attitude they had toward the people. And everyone you know, cooperating with that. They, the leaders, were special. Oh, yeah. Let's go to Matthew 23, 5 through 7, and then we'll follow it up with John 11, 48. In Matthew 23, Jesus is talking about these Pharisees, or actually, I think he's talking to these Pharisees. Now, in this case, I think it's about 23... Verse 5. Yeah, he's talking about. He says, everything they do, and he, they is the Pharisees and leaders uh, of the Jews, everything they do is done for people to see. They make their phylacteries wide. The phylacteries was that box that they had on their, either on their, their forehead or on their arm, and it carried scripture. It carried special scripture. And the bigger it was, the more scripture it carried, the more holy they appeared to be. 
Make their phylacteries wide and their tassels on their garments long. Remember, the, the uh, men were required to wear tassels on their robes. And those tassels were to remember uh, things of God. And so if they made those tassels long, they looked holier. Like, hey, this is one who really remembers God. They love the place of honor at banquets and the most important seats in the synagogue. They love to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to be called rabbi by others. Now, when Jesus encountered them and kept cutting them down, it kept hitting them right there. They loved that pride, that prestige, that honor that they received. And when Jesus, not only did he not give them that honor, but he argued against them in such a way that other people went, yeah. And, and so really kind of started damaging their reputation. And so absolutely, that point is well, well made. And it's, I think what we're getting to right now is the meat and potatoes of why they wanted to kill him. There is a religious piece, and we'll get to that. Um, in my notes, I actually started with that because I wanted to give them a benefit of the doubt. <laughs> but to be honest, this is why they wanted to kill him. This is why they wanted to cut out the competition. So let's go to John 11. John 11, they had just witnessed miracles. And they're trying to talk about what are we going to do with this guy? And so in John 11, verse 48 if we let him go on, okay, uh, uh, let's go one sentence before that. Here is this man performing many signs. So, okay, they saw the signs. They witnessed the signs. They could not deny that Jesus did miracles. All right, so what do we do about this? If we get, let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and then the Romans will come and take away both our temple and our nation. So there was also an aspect of not just personal pride, personal prestige, personal reputation, but it was in a context of a Jewish nation, a lifestyle that Rome had let them live. And so not only did they fear for their reputation, but they also feared for their place in society. And that place in society meant that Rome had to stay away. And so this man is coming in and what seems to be causing a stir, causing an uprising. And if that uprising gets strong enough, bold enough, Rome's going to come in and say, okay, you no longer have Israel, you no longer have the place in the world that you did. You no longer have the freedoms that we allowed you. And so Rome is going to put a kibosh on this. And we actually do see that played out in 70 AD and beyond. Um, AD 70, I should say, AD 70 and beyond. Um, so they were fearful of that. So they had personal prestige and honor. Uh, pride, reputation, and then they had political prestige and honor. They wanted to make sure that their nation was in a practical security so that they could continue being and doing what they have done in the past. Um, but let's give them, let's try to be nice and give them um, some benefit of the doubt. Because of their experiences 400 years prior, where uh, and, and beyond, actually more like 600 years prior. But um, all of the Assyrian and Babylonian captivities and the prophets kept saying, look, this is happening because you are ignoring the laws of God. You are ignoring God. So when they come back from captivity, Ezra kind of tries to reignite. Nehemiah tries to reignite the spiritual sense within them. And so they make a commitment. Hey, a certain segment of them, I should say, make a commitment. We're going to follow these laws of God. And by goodness, we're going to follow them to a T. And so they extend these laws into these checklists that become longer and longer and harder to, to follow. But the purpose behind that was so that they would not be captive yet again. And so there is a... Probably a very small, but a very um, honorable part of them that want to kill Jesus because he is taking them down a road, taking the people down a road that does not seem to fit with all those practices that they have built up over time that were intended for honoring God and, and, and following his practices, following his, his design. 
Now, we have already talked about how his design is not necessarily what was laid out at that day and age because they had already changed things by their own traditions and, and um, interpretations. Yeah. Fear, absolutely. Fear. Ooh. Living today in fear. <laughs> yes, yes. And then coming from that... Um, that ideal that it, if we give them the benefit of the doubt that they're really looking at this from a religious standpoint from a I am trying to be godly and set a godly practice standpoint Jesus was coming forward with some statements that were very contrary to their belief system now I won't say it's God's system but their belief system when Jesus came forward and he said things like I am the son of man or other people called him the Son of Man, and he did not deny it. Son of Man, in their language, was the Messiah, who claimed to be Son of God, or God himself. Lord of the Sabbath, what does that mean? God himself. Greater than the temple. Jesus had just said, you know, one greater than the temple is here. He is claiming to be God, which in their framework, in their system, was blasphemy. And in their framework, in their system, and even in God's system, blasphemy was punishable by death. And so we could go so far, if we give them the benefit of the doubt, to say that they want to kill him because that was the right thing to do religiously. Now, what Steve said, I think, is absolutely true. I don't think that's, you know, the religiosity is not the underlying, is it locked? Okay. <laughs> oh, that's yeah. fine. Well, at least there's somebody here. You bet. We're in good shape. Good. Um, so, I, you know, we could say that they were doing it because of their religiosity and give them that benefit of the doubt. But I think fundamentally they wanted to kill him because he hurt them where it, where it counted the most. In their societal position and in their, repu their personal pride and reputation. And we see that because Jesus and, and, and John both lay that out. And, and we see it. So, as we ended the last, you know, in March, the Jews wanted to kill him. So now we get to move into the next section where we see what the response is. Jesus in uh, Matthew, oh, I better turn to Matthew. Matthew 12, verse 15. Aware of this, Jesus withdrew from that place. Now a large crowd followed him. And he healed all who were ill. He warned them not to tell others about him. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. Here is my servant whom I have chosen. The one I love in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will proclaim justice to the nations. He will not quarrel or cry out. No one will hear his voice in the street. A bruised reed he will not break. A smoldering wick he will not snuff out. Till he has brought justice through to victory. In his name... The nations will put their hope. So this, Matthew couches this as Jesus' response um, in, in a way to the moment where the Jews want to kill him. Or one of the moments where the Jews want to kill him. So let's work our way through this. It does not say how long or to where he withdrew. Uh, it could be, and we know time in Matthew is not necessarily uh, straightforward. Sometimes Matthew skips around. Sometimes long periods of time happen between each bit of narrative. So we don't necessarily know how long it was that he withdrew or to where he withdrew. It may have been a little, a little distance, a little time, or it may have been a long distance and a long time. And part of the reason I say that is the piece out of Isaiah is not just a comment about the Jews. It's a comment about the Gentiles. And so to say he withdrew and not know where to where he withdrew. Um, it may be that he spent some time in Gentile territory. It may not. We don't know. We do know he went at least once to Gentile territory. Um, but a large crowd, it says, followed him. It does, we don't know that they followed him from that point or what, to wherever he went, a large crowd gathered. We just don't know how that practically happened. But we do know a large crowd was there, 
at a time when once again he heal, heals all who were ill. We've seen that over and over. Um, that was part of Jesus' ministry. And it was part of a witness to who he was as Messiah. That's important to understand. Um, when the Jews read their Old Testament or read the, the Hebrew Scriptures, one of the pointers, one of the, the evidences of the Messiah was that he would come and bring healing. Remember all those verses in Isaiah where he would heal the blind, he would uh, heal the lame, you know, the lepers would be cleansed, all of those verses. So the healing was evidence of his messiahship. And yet he warned them not to tell others about him. We've addressed that before, but why, was, why would that be? Why would he not want people to proclaim, hey, this man Jesus healed me. The best reason I can think of is it wasn't his time. It was really about a timing thing. There was, and, and I believe, there was a set time, even portrayed in the Old Testament, that Jesus would suffer. And that time had not come to fruition yet. Jesus knew that that time was not yet. And if you push the envelope far enough, fast enough, things would sell, uh, accelerate to an extent where um, it wouldn't die, his sacrifice wouldn't be in the time frame that it was supposed to be. Now that's saying a lot, and I'm taking a fairly, I won't say a big leap, but I'm making a lot of interpretations when I say that. But I think there was a designated time, and Jesus was en route to hit that time. And he did not want to push the envelope and make it any faster or later. Oh, yes. Yes. Couldn't fulfill practically the mission that he had. Yeah. So, and I think so much of the time the scripture talks about the time being right or way up God's time. And the God's time for a year is nothing like what our time for a year is. Right. And that sort of thing. I think timing with God is very precise. He has it down. And we just Right. Which is a very, very hard part. Right. And. Remember that they, the Jews at that time were very hopeful that a Messiah would come, not a Messiah that saves them eternally, a Messiah that saves them from Rome. And I think fundamentally they might have, if they had really thought through that, it would be more than Rome. But Rome was their focus. They were so short-sighted, short blinded. That was what they were focusing on. And so we could even read in, um, in John... 6, 15, I believe it is. No. Oh, maybe so. Wrong verse or chapter. Yes. Jesus, knowing they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. There were, I mean, these people that gathered around him, you have such a good positive reputation for doing outstanding things, they're going to affect the timeline, or not just the timeline, but the events. And they wanted to set him up as king, not eternal king, king of Israel against Rome. And so Jesus, knowing that, had to separate himself. He had to get away. So one thing that setting himself up as king would do, or, or the, the reputation of, or the rumor of setting himself up as king, would trigger the Pharisees and the leaders. And we don't want the Pharisees and leaders to be triggered too early to come kill him, 
because of that time frame that God has set. I, I think there's a lot to that. You want to say something? Starting with the given that he could have miraculously extricated himself from any situation, yeah. he appears for reasons we can't fully know unless he chooses to tell us that he did not want to do an overt miracle every time things were beginning to get off the timeline. Right. There were apparently a couple of times when he seems to have miraculously disappeared. disappeared. In crowd. Yes, wow. in his own town. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, for the most part, he was trying not to work in that way. Right. To control things. When he could, he did something that was not that God was helping him do it, of course, but he, he tried to do it by ways that. Uh, Human yeah. Seen yes. Human when there's a tangible way out, he would take it. Absolutely. Uh, and, and we're going to get to that. Actually, in this prophecy that's quoted here from Isaiah, we have to remember God and Jesus could have forced everybody to bow, forced everybody to believe and understand, but they chose not to because they want us to make that choice the whole idea is that we would choose him so they want Jesus ministry was not to force people to bow today it's to force people to think through and understand not force force the bad word help people create a scenario in which people would think through and understand this is this is the work of God Wow what should I do in this in the face of this work of God so it's inviting us to make a decision. It's inviting us to make, um, to, to, to think through and make a change in our life or inviting these, these people at this time. Jesus and God could have forced the issue, but they chose not to. So let's take that to this Isaiah prophecy. This is taken from the book of Isaiah uh, 42, chapter 42. But uh, the, verse, the, the snippet that's actually given to us here, here is, I want you to listen to this. And you remember when I talked about the idea of an inclusio, where we have a statement, another statement, another statement, and then it's followed up by kind of a similar statement, and then yet another similar statement to the second one. We have one of those here. So I want you to think through this as we see this inclusio play out. Here's my servant whom I have chosen, the one I love, in whom I delight. Okay, so the idea here is that God chose his, his servant. How did I write that? That's actually how I wrote it. God chose Jesus as servant. All right. I will put my spirit on him and he will proclaim justice to the nations. All right. Servant. Proclaims justice. Note here, though, the nations is not the Jewish people. The nations is all people, Gentiles especially. So the idea, even going back to Isaiah, is that the Jews will not always, first and foremost, remain God's people. First and foremost, the whole idea even of Abraham, the promise to Abraham, all nations would be blessed through you. So here we see that again. And they understood that. They may not have liked that, but they understood that. All right, so he will not quarrel or cry out. No one will hear his voice in the streets. Wait a minute, that just sounds weird. What does that even mean? He will not quarrel or cry out. His voice will not be heard in the streets. Well, we know that technically his voice was heard in the streets. Technically, there were moments where he um, was confrontational. But what that really means is that he won't be argumentative and insincere in his ministerial work. He will not be that street corner preacher that has a bit of insincerity. In, in, in his message may be okay but his reasoning may not be okay. His rationale may not be okay. He 
is not going to be one of those who continues to force his agenda down your throat. He's not going to be argument, argumentative in that sort of way. And so we have to, we have to think of that, about that. Remember when we just had the conversation, God and Jesus in Jesus' ministry, their plan was not to force belief. Open the door to belief, but not force belief. And so what we have here is the servant will not be argumentative. And that's having a disposition of argumentation is really what that's meant. Because we know that he confronted, but he did not have that continual disposition. Or insincere, or insincere. He is not going to be insincere. Maybe I better. As well as I'm remembering names today, I'm probably not gonna be able to spell anything either. <laughs> All right, so. So far, that's what Isaiah says. Now, let's watch as the narrative backs itself back out to the beginning. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. You remember what um, Jesus noticed when he sent his disciples out? He noticed that the people were harassed and exhausted. He saw that people were frustrated and just tired of trying to keep up these ritualistic laws. And we could see again later in chapter 11, come to me all you who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. Jesus could see the people tired. And Isaiah prophesies long ago, and here Matthew is saying this is, this is the fulfillment of this prophecy, a bruised reed he will not break. He's not going to break your back. He wants to help you. He wants to support you. All right? How does that go here? He's not going to be argumentative in the way he, his manner, in his disposition, in his message. He is going to be helpful. He is gentle and I don't know, see if I can really write this word, beneficent. Okay, you see how that kind of parallels? All right, the next verse. A, let's see. Till he has brought, a, a bruised reed he will not break, a smoldering wick he will not snuff out, till he has brought justice through to victory. Brings justice to victory. Servant proclaims justice. Brings justice. Okay, and then at the very last, in his name, the nations, remember, this is not just the Jewish people, the nations will put their hope. In his name, the nations will put, so here we have something a little different. All nations choose him. Here God chose the servant. At the end, and this is, this is what makes this such a strong point. It's paralleling, it's paralleling, it's paralleling. Ah, the real point. All nations choose, not just God. People choose to follow and to love. And so that is um, I, I I like to see that as kind of this moment of breathing, this, this respite in the middle of all of this frustrating text where Jesus is confronting or confronted by the Pharisees and the leaders. We get this little moment of, okay, let's take a breath. Let's remember what this is all about. Let's go back to our basics. Where's God in all of this? Because we're going to dive right back into another confrontation. Okay, so that's how I see that. Um, yeah, I already did that. The next little point, if, we'll, we'll get started on it, but we won't be able to finish it today. This next section begins, I'm going to say a turning point in Jesus' ministry. 
it is, I think, the confrontation with the Pharisees that caused him, and I don't know if cause is the appropriate word, but it is the catalyst that drives him to change his style of ministry, to change the way he approaches the narrative. How does he form the narrative about who he is and who, what the kingdom of heaven is, why he's there? And so this, this next little bit, they accuse him, the, the leaders accuse him of using a demonic spiritual power. They misappropriate the spirit by which Jesus does the, the things he does. And that becomes the turning point for Jesus in how he approaches his ministry. I don't know necessarily that they forced him into it, but he chose to change his ministry in light of this fact, or it appears that he chose to change his ministry at this point for whatever reason. So we're going to go through this. This next section is verse 22 through 37. So basically, um, it's, it's all Jesus responding to an accusation. Verse 22 then they, we don't know who they are. It could be the Pharisees. It could be generically just the people. But the Pharisees were present. They brought him a demon-possessed man. And it does not say that this was on the Sabbath. So I think we are moved on and away from the whole Sabbath conversation. But they brought him a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute. And Jesus healed him so that he could both talk and see. Do you remember at the end of... I want to say it was chapter 9. Yes. Verse, well, 27, but really, verse 32. I believe this is the one I'm looking at. When they were going out, a man who was demon-possessed and could not talk was brought to Jesus. When the demon was driven out, the man who had been mute spoke, and the crowd was amazed. Nothing like this has ever been seen in Israel. And note this next verse. Verse 34 of chapter 9. The Pharisees said, It is by the prince of demons that he drives out demons. Okay? So... In Matthew 9, and I alluded to this, if I remember correctly, I alluded to the idea that this might be the same scenario as occurs later. This is the later that we're, we're talking about today. And I believe that this may have been included in this narrative. This, Mark, or Matthew 9, Matthew 8 and 9 was included as a segment, I believe, of a particular narrative, a particular uh, editorial uh, piece of work that Matthew wanted to put out. And then he began a new component of that work in, in chapter 10. And this that we're now reading in chapter 12, I believe could be, I don't know that it is, but I believe it could be the same situation that we read about in chapter 9. The accusation is the same. Because here it says, all the people were astonished and said, could this be the son of David? Now notice what the Pharisees said, verse 32, uh, I'm sorry, verse 24. When the Pharisees heard this, they said, It is only by Beelzebul, some of your uh, translations may say Beelzebub, the prince of demons, that this fellow drives out demons. A couple directions I want to take this. Um, one is very practical. Um, you know what, let's, before we go there, let's talk about this, this Beelzebub, this Beelzebul. Who is Beelzebub from a literal sense? We read in the, in the Old Testament, 2 Kings 1, this caricature, this, this god called Beelzebub. Now, if you go into the, the literary, the Greek, or even the Hebrew, you remember reading in the Old Testament this word Baal, Baal. That means Lord. And the Canaanites, in general, had a lot of Baals, Baals, a lot of gods, a lot of lords. Sometimes they were all grouped together. Um, but 
they would have a Lord of this, a Lord of this, a Lord of this, a Lord of this. In 2 Kings 1, we read about the Jews calling one of these gods Beelzebub. Beelzebub is a conglomeration of a couple of words that means Lord of the Flies. Okay? Lord of the Flies. Possibly because um, it was down in Ekron in, in this particular instance in 2 Kings 1, the God that they're talking about was down in Ekron, the Philistine area. And the Philistine area itself had a lot of mosquitoes. It was down on the coast. Well known for malaria, well known for mosquito, mosquitoes. So flies could be representative of mosquitoes. Because you had the Lord of the harvest, the Lord of the sun, the Lord of the water, the Lord of this and that. Well, the Lord of the mosquitoes. Well, that was the Lord down there because, you know, of all the mosquitoes or the flies. However, there was a little twist on this that the Jews liked to throw out because they were making fun of, of all of these other gods a lot of the time. And so it can be interpreted instead of Beelzebul, Lord of the Flies, or Lord of the Mosquitoes, potentially. Beelzebub, Lord of the Dung. So in their connotation, it's kind of a diss. It's kind of a, you know, it's weird if you read the Second Kings thing because the king sends someone down to this Lord of the Dung to find out what's going to happen to him. So there's a respect there, but then there's a disrespect in the naming convention. Over time, however, Beelzebub, Beelzebul, came to be related to or a, an alias of Satan himself. And so by the time we see it in the first century, and, and its usage in the first century is no longer really about the, the Lord of the Flies, or the Lord of the Dung, or whatever. It's really about Satan. So anytime someone says, it is through the power of Beelzebub, they're really talking about demonic power, Satan's power. So here, the Jews are claiming that Jesus' power comes from Satan. There are some evidences as well. Um, not just in, in the biblical text, but in other texts, especially in the, um, uh, the Talmud. There is a text that talks about Jesus bringing sorcery back from Egypt when he lived down in Egypt. It, it's really cool, too, because that's kind of an extra biblical, if you want to call it that, evidence that there was a spell of time that Jesus was in Egypt. Here's what it says. Uh, our Elias, and remember <clears throat> the Talmud and, and, and rabbinical teaching, this whole idea of authority, Jesus taught as if he had authority. It means he didn't have to rely or refer to someone else. Most often a rabbi would refer to someone else and just kind of group their teaching or regurgitate the teaching of someone else. Here it says, our Elias said to the sages, so it's a reference. <clears throat> but did not Ben Stata, we'll have to come back to that, it's a reference to Jesus. Ben Stata is a reference to Jesus. Bring forth witchcraft from Egypt by means of scratches that is in the form of charms, on his flesh. He was a fool, answered they, and proof... Oh, he was a fool, answered they, and proof cannot be adduced from fools. That's the saying from the Talmud. Who's been Stata? Ben means son of. Stata is said to be a Roman guard or Roman soldier. And the story was that, G, that Mary did not have a miraculous birth. She did not miraculously birth Jesus. She had an affair with a Roman soldier named Stata. And so Jesus, in their teaching, was Ben Stata, son of Stata, son of this Roman soldier. And here it says, didn't, didn't he, the son of this Roman soldier, Jesus, bring witchcraft, demonic capabilities out of Egypt. Okay, I like, I, I kind of like that because it, it confirms that he was in Egypt because we don't see the Egyptian stay in other texts. And so a lot of scholars have questioned whether or not that's even real. 
But what's cool is that gives evidence to at least someone believed that he had a stay in Egypt. And out of Egypt, he had these markings or these kind of underlying capacities to practice witchcraft, satanic. This is written in the Talmud? Yes. Yes. So, it's not, I won't, I, <laughs> it's not um, an unusual view that Jesus would be practicing by the spirit of Satan. Okay. But I want to talk about this idea. We already read a verse, John 11, and, and there are others that we could point to, where they acknowledge that Jesus is doing miracles. And they say, we can't do anything about that. So what do you do if you can't counteract the wisdom, the logic, or the practical signs of someone who's doing something. You call them names. You criticize their character. You try to change public opinion. Because you can't logically confront them. They already tried that. They already tried to get him to say something he shouldn't say. So what they try to do is they create a different public opinion of Jesus. And by creating this public opinion, what they do is they blaspheme the spirit by which he does his work. Okay? And there are places when Jesus himself says, look, you can criticize me, but don't touch God. Don't touch the work of my father. Um, and so let's, let's go on with this. I, I kind of wanted to lay that out. It kind of sets some groundwork. And you can see why this could create a turning point in the way Jesus approaches his ministry. Okay, so here we are. Um, we'll repeat verse 24. When the Pharisees heard this, they said, It is only by Beelzebub, the prince of demons, that this fellow drives out demons. Now Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined. Every city or household divided against itself will not stand. Wow. There's some knowledge for you. And that is not the, the last time we heard that, is it? We've even heard an American president use that same idea. Okay, so divided can't stand. If Satan drives out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then can his kingdom stand? So here's his logic. He turns their logic against him. And, and he uses logic to do this. If I drive out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your people drive them out? Wait a minute. Did people try to do that back then? Yes. They actually had people who were, um, well, what's the word? Where you pull out demons? Uh, exorcists. They had exorcists at that time. And so Jesus is saying, hey, by what spirit or what, by what power do your people do that? They will be your judges. If it's by the Spirit of God that I drive out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Notice they had a lot of evidences in the Old Testament as to who the Messiah was going to be. They could have looked to those evidences. And again, some of them did, but they chose to ignore them. Okay. So he says, look, you know what those evidences are. If it's by the spirit of God that I drive out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. The kingdom is here, he's saying. Look, you have to make a choice. You have to choose sides. Or again, how can anyone enter a strong man's house? This is gonna, he's going into a, a kind of a repeat of the argument here. How can anyone enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man? Then he can plunder his house. Whoever is not with me is against me. Whoever does not gather with me scatters. And so I tell you, every kind of sin and slander can be forgiven, but blasphemy against the Spirit, which will not be forgiven. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or the age to come. Yes, we'll come back, we'll talk through that. Probably not today, but 
Make a tree good and its fruit will be good. Make a tree bad and its fruit will be bad. For a tree is recognized by its fruit. You brood of vipers. That's always interesting to me. Because what did he just do? He just called them children of Satan. Brood of vipers. What was a viper? What was a snake? The connotation is, it's another slang, the connotation is children of Satan. So, you brood of vipers, how can you who are evil say anything good? For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. The good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him, and the evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. But if I tell you that everyone will have an account, uh, but, but I tell you that everyone will have to account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken, for by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. That is a very deep dialogue. And we will parse through that um, probably next week. Um, well, definitely next week. But I just want you to see that this was his counter to their accusation. And I find it interesting that he sums up his counter right back where it started and calling them children of Satan. He also, at the very end of all of this, when we get all the way down to verse 43, he talks about demon possession. Where did this start? Verse 22, demon possessed man. Fascinating how he turns it all around. But there's so much meat and potatoes right there in the middle and so much that I think has been chewed on, probably misinterpreted over and over, probably partly interpreted correctly. But we want to think through this, this little segment. So we'll take our time to do it. We don't want to slip through it really fast today. Um, but definitely he, is, he starts out with logic. Look, if I'm practicing kicking demonic beings out of people, what logic says I'm using demonic uh, abilities to do that? I'm just hurting myself, if that's, you know, just logically. And then he stops being logical. It's like, it's, okay, so I threw that out because that just makes no sense. People, you hearing this? You hear that makes no sense? All right, now let's really get to the heart of the matter. And then he starts talking about the heart of the matter. So we'll get to that heart of the matter probably next week. What do I want to say until then? I've already done that. I've already done that. Oh, I loved, I'm glad that we're at this point at least a little bit today. In the lesson today that Greg brought, a lot of the emphasis on today's lesson was Jesus knew who he was and where he came from. And this gets to the heart of that. They're accusing him of coming from somewhere else. And when we saw in the lesson today, John 13, Greg's lesson was in John 13, and mainly in verse 3 is, is the heart of this particular message. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under His power and that He had come from God and was returning to God. And the emphasis on today's lesson was, who am I, Jesus? Who, who is Jesus? Where did He come from? Why was he doing what he was doing? And it was interesting to me that that was today's message when I was thinking about doing this in class and how the Jews were accusing him of coming from and doing a totally different, completely opposite practice and, and source. I thought, oh, how, how convenient that that was today's message. <laughs> but I really liked that. So I actually made a note in my, my notes about that. I think we probably want to quit there so that we can really get into Jesus' response. We will start, um, where are we? We will start verse, let's, let's start at verse, well, 29. We'll probably recap, you know how I do that. I just do a little bit of recap before, but, but we'll really start in verse 29 next week because we really want to talk through this section that most people have now called the unforgivable sin. Okay, 
We want to be able to, to di dialogue through that. What makes it unforgivable? What is it and what makes it unforgivable? And I think it's actually a lot easier than people try to make it. But, um, and, and you guys probably already know that. But we just want to make sure that we express it, we understand it, and then we can move on. He, he talks about, okay, knowing that, where's your heart? Because your actions, your works, really come from your heart. And if you remember a couple chapters ago, it was all about when they were questioning John, or when, when John was questioning who he was, and Jesus turned to the people and said, you know, John came and you didn't like him. I'm coming and you didn't, don't like the way I am. But really, it's through the works that you need to be thinking. That works plays an important part. And here it comes up again. The works show who you really are. Uh, you are known by your works. Um, and that was said before um, in that prior passage as well. So we'll talk through that. And then we'll get, uh, maybe, if we make it next week, we'll get to this very interesting passage about Jonah. I love the passage about Jonah. Partly because people question whether Jonah was real. And I can tell you, there was a man named Jonah. It's documented in the Old Testament, not in the book of Jonah. There are other places in the Old Testament that document that Jonah existed. The story of Jonah, though, is attested here. And the reason for the story of Jonah is attested here. So we'll talk about that hopefully next week as well. Let's pray and then we can be dismissed. Lord, thank you so much for who you are and all that you've given to us. You have blessed us so much. Help us to not take uh, for granted all those blessings. And help us, Father, to turn those blessings into shining beacons for you that others can see our heart and our works and they see you in them and they can celebrate who Jesus is because of us. Lord, thank you so much for each person in this class, uh, whether they're present today or, or uh, missing today. Father, we pray for your hand of peace and comfort and healing and joy on each one of us and help us as we uh, go through this next week to make sense of all the chaos that might be brewing around us and to, uh, to really get down to understand what it's really all about and help us to focus on you in all of it so that no matter what happens around us, we can be that lighthouse, that shining beacon for you. Lord, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for his willingness to come to this earth to teach and uh, to witness, to die as a sacrifice. Thank you, Father, that he is willing to take the penalty that is mine, that is ours, upon himself, and that we can be forgiven through, through him, through his act. Thank you, Father, for resurrection. Thank you, Father, for eternity. It's through Christ we pray. Amen.